I would now, now like to welcome our next speaker, Ed Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson is currently um, a tenured professor of ophthalmology and pediatrics at the MUSC Storm Eye Institute. He is the author, of course, of a um, encyclopedic uh, book, textbook on pediatric cataract surgery, which is a real treasure uh, box. It contains a lot of wisdom, a lot of information, and um, it uh, is, um, he is also he has, has served in many functions, including um, president of our sister um, uh, society, the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Uh, with no further ado, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Ed Wilson. He will uh, speak on pediatric cataract surgery challenges and recommendations for 2022. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ed Wilson. I want to thank the SOE and Dr. DeFaber for inviting me to participate uh, in this session. My topic is pediatric cataract surgery, challenges and recommendations for 2022. Now, one challenge we have uh, is operating on young infants. And there has been many uh, publications indicating that the outcomes, at least the uh, uh, reoperation outcomes are worse if an implant is placed in the first six to seven months of age. And I think that um, uh, most of us now leave these children aphakic. Um, this presents some challenges, of course. Now, this is the way I tend to do the surgery. I like bimanual surgery. Uh, this is a five week old. You can see the, the palpebral fissure small, hard to get the lid speculum in there. I use a 25 gauge vitrector and an irrigating cannula through two paracentesis openings. I do a vitrector cut anterior capsulotomy. I aspirate the lens. I do a vitrector cut posterior capsulectomy and then an anterior vitrectomy without ever having to leave the eye. So the nice thing, it's one time in, one time out, very fast, less inflammation when there's not multiple entries. I do use a tenovicral suture to um, close the wounds. And for me, I place the contact lens at the end of the surgery. You may or may not have that option, but for me, I have calculated, here's this child one day post-op. So I have already calculated the power of implant, I mean, the power of contact lens that I need. Um, we developed a specific A constant for the sill soft contact lens. And we use that with our biometry just as though it were an implant. Now, another reason to leave these children aphakic, this is a graph showing mean and median uh, reduction in contact lens power early in life. It's really a moving target. There's a lot of changes that occur in the power of the contact lens. The Silsoft contact lens is now um, back on the market in the United States. The FDA in the US approved the new packaging. And so we're about to be again, fully stocked with Silsoft. I'm not sure that that has worked out in Europe and you may be struggling to find a different contact lens or even a, even a daily wear option. And don't forget about aphakic glasses. Aphakic glasses work great. And at least in the bilateral cases, that's one way to bide some time until the child is old enough and the growth slows down, and then you may want to put in a secondary intraocular lens. Now, there are cases, uh, again, some families really are challenged by the use of a contact lens. And in unilateral cases, you really can't use aphakic spectacles. Um, one option I would like you to consider is using a three-piece um, intraocular lens, placing the lens haptics in the sulcus, and then doing a bicapsular capture. Uh, this is easier to do in an infant and also easier to exchange compared to in the bag with posterior optic capture. So what I've done here, this is a fairly calcific capsule, but 
this family would not do well with contact lenses. And so I've placed this lens in the sulcus and now I'm struggling a little bit, but I'm gonna capture this optic. Now that allows the capsular bag to seal so that you don't get that high rate of visual axis opacification from uh, new cortex reproliferation. Now it's, I use this example just because it shows you that the bag is very resilient. Um, there, even with struggling, I've gotten a good bicapsular capture uh, in, this, uh, in this instance. Now, because we are leaving a lot of these young babies aphakic these days, um, there are more secondary intraocular lenses needed as the children get older. My peak time is around age four, five, six, but not every child needs a secondary implant, but many are ready to uh, stop with the glasses or the contacts. Most of my secondary implants these days are in the capsular bag. What you've seen me do here is open the Somering ring, using an MVR blade. And now I'm taking the 25 gauge retractor and turn the cutting port on its side. And I am walking my way all the way around 360 degrees to reopen the capsular bag and create a new anterior capsule opening. If the first surgery has been done correctly with matching anterior and posterior capsule openings, then the Somring ring that is created, and that's age dependent, you get more Somring ring, the younger the patient was at surgery, that new material keeps the bag open. It, it holds that space. Once you open the, the Somring ring, you really are obligated to remove all that material, clean it out, take the time to clean it out, all the time I'm visualizing my new anterior capsule opening. But this allows me to use a single piece lens, a lens that I would only place in the capsule bag. Now I'm putting ophthalmic viscosurgical device within the reopened capsule bag. And I think here in a moment, you'll be able to visualize that there is a new anterior capsule opening. I think you can see it I can see it all the way around. Uh, I know that I've created space with the OVD. Um, if the white ring, which represents the posterior capsule, it was where the capsules fused. If that white ring is near the visual axis, you may wanna remove it, but I would urge you to not remove it until after the lens is safely in place in the capsular bag. When you're removing the OVD and you go under the optic, then you can trim that white ring if necessary. I don't think I trimmed it in this case because it is really outside of the visual axis and it's not gonna be seen unless the pupil is, um, is dilated. So here I was able to use a single piece lens that's really only appropriate for in the bag. And with this child, that lens is gonna to need to stay in for decades. So I feel better that it is now in the capsular bag. Um, I will again, sew the wound with tenovicral. I like vicral because I don't have to go and remove it later. Uh, hopefully you have access to, um, to tenovicral, if not, you use nylon and then you have to go back and So here I've removed OVD from anterior to the optic, but also from posterior to the optic. Um, I rotate the lens so I don't run into a haptic when I do that, uh, that maneuver right there. Now here's my typical case of a child who's old enough this is a two-year-old to um, receive a primary intraocular lens. I use a manual capsulorexis with a small incision capsulorexis forcep. I use bimanual irrigation and aspiration. 
put the lens in the bag with the posterior capsule intact, take out all the OVD, and then I go pars plana to remove the posterior capsule. Now, doesn't mean that you can't do it anterior. Of course you can, and there are many ways to get this job done. What I found is that I have much more control this way. All the OVD is, is gone. Um, I was taught that if you're gonna cut vitreous, do your best to cut it where it lives. Uh, I go through using an MVR, use, I use a 25 gauge MVR. I was also taught that a trocar is used for tool transfer. And if you're only gonna go in once, it makes more sense just to use an MVR and then I close it. I know it may not need to be closed, but I close it with a vicral suture anyway. Now, we remove a lot of posterior capsules in children because of the rate of PCO is so high. That's another challenge. It's an old challenge, but it's one that we continue to, to deal with. You can see cellular reproliferation that has stopped at the posterior capsule edge here. I find that I'm doing more posterior capsule removals rather than less as the kids get older. YAG laser in children can be um, easy or hard. And if you're going to do a YAG laser in the office, I would, I would tell you to do it early. Do it as soon as PCO starts because as shown in this upper um, my left, upper left picture, um, quickly the, the PCO gets so thick that the laser won't go through it. And in cases like this, we end up having to go back to the operating room and do it through the pars plana. Now, here's another thing we deal with. This is a successful YAG laser, but you have all this material because the vitreous is formed, all this capsular material and reproliferation material even when you've freed up the visual axis, in this case, I still had to go back through the pars plana to clean all this debris up that um, you wouldn't see in, in an adult. So that leads me to do more posterior capsule uh, removal rather than less. Another challenge we deal with is in ectopia lentis, the, the ones that progress rapidly in childhood tend not to be the ones that are very good for um, capsule sparing uh, types of maneuvers. Um, they're certainly okay to use in selected cases, but we, we struggle with these very rapidly progressing subluxation where it makes more sense to remove the capsule bag. Now for me, um, my best option is to use the artisan aphakia in tracker lens. Um, we have a more limited access to these than you do in Europe. Uh, we have to do it through a compassionate use clinical trial protocol. But I now have done 93 of these. I have a few more coming up. I have enjoyed having access to this lens. I know you've had access to it for, for a long, much longer period of time than me. But many of our cases now have five years or more of follow-up and, and they're, they're doing quite well. We are not allowed by the FDA protocol to inclubate the lens on the posterior side of the, of the uh, iris. So I can't speak to that. I know that's popular. Um, just the way the protocol was written, we can only attach it on the anterior um, surface. We have to follow the protocol or we don't get access to the lens. Now, there is beginning to be more literature on using the um, flanged intrascleral fixation, the so-called Yamani technique, um, uh, first introduced by Yamani at the ASCRS meeting several years ago with the winning the grand prize video. And uh, so more and more people, I'm, I'm beginning to trust that this can be used in children. I use it now for children who do not qualify for the artisan, mostly because they either don't have good iris or I can't prove that they have 
of qualifying uh, 3.2 millimeter anterior chamber depth. Um, this is one that really had no iris. This eye also has a, um, uh, it has a glaucoma ceton. I had to move my marks a little bit because the glaucoma ceton was in place. And this is a, a bit challenging. There's a, there's a, a, a learning curve. I'm better, I think, at it than I was in this case. This happened to be the first one that I did and it worked okay, but um, pediatric eyes are softer. And even with, a, with an AC maintainer, um, it, the eye really doesn't ever firm up. Uh, and, uh, and, and this second haptic is a challenge. I do recommend that you use the, um, the Zeiss CT Lucia lens because the haptics are so much better at uh, not kinking. Um, they will take much more punishment than the, um, uh, than the three-piece uh, Alcon lens, for instance. Now, if you're an adult cataract surgeon and you do a lot of kids, the most popular technique you're gonna have is a manual posterior capsorexis and no vitrectomy. Um, and I, that is a, that's an elegant technique. And I certainly use it mostly in kids above about age five or six. Below that, I really am partial to um, adding the vitrectomy um, to prevent this, this vitreous face being used as a scaffolding. But in the older kids, um, certainly a great, a great technique. We deal with growth of the eye too, and this, that's a, a, a big challenge. One way we deal with predicting how long the eye will be and what implant we can put in to get near emetropia at age 20, for instance, is to use this regression formula. Um, this has worked well for us. It predicts the axial length in, a, in any given child, individual, at age 15, age 20, whatever you want to put in. And so we use this to uh, help us predict on an individual eye basis, which implant to put in. I'm also um, uh, dealing a little differently now with the challenge of parental compliance. We don't know, you know, some parents get the drops in really well, other parents don't get the drops in, the child fights. These physician administered medications that are now, now on the market, um, give you a sustained release around the clock with a built-in taper. They release dexamethasone uh, even when the child's asleep. And we are involved in, in uh, um, a randomized clinical trial using both Dextenza, which goes in the lacrimal puncta, and Dexa-Q, which goes in intracameral into the anterior chamber. In the older kids, I'm using it every week. I, I'm using Dextenza pretty much every week. In the older kids, the clinical trial is only on zero to three, children age zero to three. In the older kids, I found it to, um, uh, to be a very nice addition that to uh, take some of our um, parental compliance off the table. So with this Dextenza, I'm doing no drop cataract surgery in these, these older kids. I, I use intracameral antibiotics and I don't use any post-op antibiotics, and I don't use any post-op drops, uh, any steroid, unless this Dextenza proves to be uh, in active control inflammation. This is our early report, but now we have many more um, kids with this uh, insert that, uh, that have done well. So I think that's something that you should consider uh, trying. As I said, I use intracameral antibiotics. I would not do a case without intracameral antibiotics. I've been in that camp for many years. I was, this was nice to see a safety article saying that intracameral oxyfloxacin is as safe as, as putting it uh, under the con subconjunctival. But I, would, I use it in every case. And that's the end of my...
presentation. I want to give a, a shout out to Rupal Trivedi. She's my re research associate and uh, very good at analyzing data. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do any real studies without her. Thank you for your attention.